Well, good evening. Well, Robbie brought up the name J. Vernon McGee, and I thought back to time when we hosted him at our church, and he stood in the pulpit and he said, now folks, if you knew me like I know me, you wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> and then he added, but if I knew you like you know you, I wouldn't talk to you either. <laughs> Well, but we need to talk together because we're going to be looking at uh, Israel at war and uh, our focus tonight is what is the cause of the Middle East conflict? Let me just, that's, you got it, Satan to begin with, yeah, but uh, there's a story told about a crocodile who was sunning himself on the banks of the Nile when a scorpion came out of the desert and said, friend crocodile, and uh, these aren't normally friends, but uh, obviously there's a hidden agenda here. So the scorpion said, I need to get across the Nile, and why don't you let me ride on your back across the water? Well, the crocodile said, nothing doing. You, you'd sting me, and I would die. And, he, and the scorpion said, friend crocodile, if I stung you, we'd both die. We thought about that. All right, that made sense, so off they go. No sooner they get a little way out into the water that the scorpion gets agitated, stings the crocodile, and they're beginning to sink beneath the waves. And um, the crocodile says, why on earth did you do this? What possible cause could you have? And the scorpion replied, there is none. This is the Middle East. Uh, so <laughs> you... You would have to understand crocodiles and scorpions in the Middle East, but anyway, okay, you get the point. Now, the first thing to die in a war is the truth. We know that. There is propaganda on both sides. You've seen plenty of it uh, since October 7th. Uh, I mean, when you look at this, one of the things I want to do is I want to start, and it's going to take a little while, I want to explain why our country, in fact, the whole world has just kind of gone mad. Why they cannot understand, oh, you're not seeing it over there. Okay, I'll turn it on. Keep going, it'll come on. Okay. This is the Middle East. All right, not All right. So, uh, the point is that we have people <coughs> who just don't, think correctly. Now, Mike did a good job talking about truth and what it's about. I want to talk about some of that, too, in a little different fashion. Uh, here is a speech by President George Bush of the United Nations back in 2004. Notice this is after 9-11. Right? This is, you know, when we've been engaged in, with uh, Iraq and everything. Uh, he said this, when it comes to the desire for liberty and justice, there is no clash of civilizations. People everywhere are capable of freedom and worthy of freedom. The desire for freedom resides in every human heart. Well, that sounds reasonable, does it not? Okay, like, like Rodney King, can't we just all get along? I mean, what, there, there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. But he forgot what they said on 9-11 just three years earlier. Osama bin Laden said this is a Jewish Christian crusade against Islam. He called it a clash of civilizations. So obviously somebody thinks very differently. And if we look at this, especially in the case of the Palestinians, <clears throat> there's very little desire in the hearts of Arabs for the kind of freedom that the president was speaking of. You go back to the 1920s, we have Haj Amin al-Husseini, who was the Mufti of Jerusalem. Uh, he incited massacres that killed uh, eight people originally, but then it spread in 1921 to 47, and 1929 to 133. Probably the most horrific in Hebron was 67 killed in a day. And for the last 100 years, the Arabs of Palestine have committed massacres and murders of Jews in the Holy Land without ever offering a branch of peace. Haj Amin was behind the final solution for the Jewish problem in the Middle East. And he met, here he is reviewing the SS troops. He said, Arabs arise as one man and fight for your sacred rights. Kill the Jews wherever you find them. This pleases God, history, and religion. 
this saves your honor, God is with you. Now, you're already seeing that God is brought into an awful lot of things like this, and you'll see more of that. But President Bush also said something else. He said, Islam means peace. <clears throat> All right? And that was right after September 11th, in fact, the next day. Now, sure, this is, you know, uh, the kind of rhetoric you use when you want to tone down Islamophobia and the problem that could have existed, and so he meant that. But what does Islam mean? Well, if you have any, any understanding of Islam, Islam literally means surrender. And Islam demands submission to Allah and to his prophet. And Islam requires subjugation of all mankind. This is quite clear. Look what it says in the Quran. What does the Quran say? It says, Muhammad declared that Allah had commanded him to conquer all non-Muslims until all people had yielded to Islam. Here, Surah 9.5. Slay the idolaters, that's us, wherever you find them, take them captive, besiege them, and lie in wait for them in every ambush, or fight against those who do not embrace the true faith until they are utterly subdued. This is the idea. Now, all across our nation, we heard and still hear these chants of Ahlu Akbar, Ahlu Akbar, uh, 100,000 propellers to, uh, protesters in Washington, D.C., D.C., not deceived, DC, okay, we're, we're doing this. Here is the National Mall in Washington, DC, and they were all bowing down and say, Ahu Akbar. Now, same thing, it says here, chants of Alu Akbar ring through London, all around the world. And so, what is this meaning of Alu Akbar? They'll tell you it means Allah is greater or greatest, something like this, but this is what's on the lips of terrorists or you could say Muslim extremists, when they're committing acts of terror, when they're beheading people, killing people, doing things like this. Uh, so to, to say God is grace, but it's actually a declaration of jihad or holy war because God commanded that. And they are simply declaring <clears throat> that Allah will defeat his enemies and force them to submit to him. Kind of like this cartoon uh, brings in President Bush's idea. Uh, the guy says, pardon me, sir, just a moment. Surely there must be some mix-up. I was assured that Islam is a religion of peace. Well, this is not to say that every single Muslim that you ever meet across the world is this way. That's not the case. But we're talking about the leadership, the people who, who drive this, those who not only control and influence and even, well, control is probably the right word, all of those under them because... People are born into a religion. They don't make the decision. This is not a choice. It's not a matter of faith as you and I have faith. This is something to which you're born. And you go through the motions. And it's a matter of family honor, shame. All of this is very high in their thinking. And you must comply. So that's, that's why if someone from a Muslim family uh, were to go to the United States and decided to take the headdress off and put on lipstick and go attend college classes, it'd be the responsibility of either the brother or the uncle or the father to come over here and catch them and kill them to restore family honor. You can't have someone uh, dishonoring the whole family in that way. And you know, this is honor killing. It's going on all the time. Uh, when someone becomes a believer in Christ, the same thing happens. Now, the false covenant in 1988 read like this. The day of judgment will not come in, about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews. Jihad becomes the individual duty of every Muslim. Hamas also said they will never stop until the Zionists are destroyed. Uh, in their charter, and this is what defines them uh, as a... I guess you could say organization. <clears throat> it is necessary to instill in the minds of the Muslim generations that the Palestinian problem is a religious problem and should be dealt with on this basis. Wait a minute, I thought it was a political issue. I thought it was a land issue. I thought, you know, no, that's not what they say. So tonight we're going to be looking at what they say, okay, what they say the cause of all this is about. And that's important to listen to them. Here is Mahmoud al-Habas, a Supreme Sharia judge, and Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas is the Fatah, 
supposedly the more moderate Palestine, and he's his advisor. And uh, they were talking about with whom he became angry, made them apes and pigs, speaking of the Jews. Um, here's Fatih Hamad, political uh, leader of Hamas. We must attack every Jew on the face of the earth to slaughter and kill them with the help of Allah. Uh, not real moderate there. Here, <clears throat> this was a more academic understanding of Islam, but it says the Arab world rejects the whole concept of rights. Virtually every Arab country is a monarchy, a theocracy, or a military dictatorship. Freedom of speech, property rights, free elections, separation of church and state are almost non-existent. Speaking out against the rulers or against the Muslim religion leads to imprisonment or death. All attempts to start competing political parties are ruthlessly crushed. Now this is not something that I would say the younger people protesting really understand. Uh, here we go. Our LBDGQ plus, 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 plus are all saying things like uh, if when there's freedom for the Palestinians, there's freedom for all. In other words, if they're liberated, we're liberated. Uh, and, and you know how they're liberated. If you uh, go there, you can see how uh, they're thrown off of buildings, they're hung, various other things. There's no toleration for this. And yet uh, some misguided, confused people are supporting the very people who would do them in if they were in, under their control. Why don't we get it? Okay? Those in the Middle East do not think like those in the West. Islam does not differentiate between government and religion. We separate between church and state. They don't. Never heard of such a thing. Their religious construct is a theocracy, and every Muslim is opposed to the concept of democracy. Oh, well, they may live within a democracy, but they live to overthrow it whenever possible. You know, it's hard to believe, but the, the, the Muslim world has an agenda of 2050 to pretty much dominate the United States. There are, there are hundreds and hundreds of mosques throughout this country, mainly Hamas, Hamas terror networks that have been here for generations. Right? Uh, there, and of course, the immigrant situation, which we see happening, is bringing more and more all the time, uh, fighting age men with these kind of ideals. So they exist for the class of civilizations, the goal of conquering and subjecting every other civilization to Islam. There are no such concepts as peace and justice in the social sense, but only what the Quran has declared to be just or unjust, and this does not apply to the treatment of non-Muslims, okay, or demi second-class citizens like Christians would be, people of the book. There is peace, but only peace when they subdue you and you come under uh, Islam. So, as it says, peace only exists when you are subdued. Uh, Muslims oppose the concept of freedom. They don't think in terms of humanity, but in terms of what makes for Islamic unity under the governance of Sharia law, which does not regard individual rights or personal liberty like our U.S. Constitution. We have one of the best constitutions in the whole world. Okay, look at Canada. Compare Canada to us and realize the freedoms we have. Muslims do not value life here, but consider their citizens' lives as their enemies' lives, expendable for the sake of achieving the glory of martyrdom. So listen to what they say. I, don't, I have videos, but not playing those. I'll just show you some of the statements. Um, here is Hamas leader Muhammad Daif. Those we who... We love death for Allah like you love life. Okay? We hear him say it, but we don't believe it. Here, again, who compete among themselves for martyrdom like you flee from death. Or here is Ismail Hanea. He's the Palestinian, Hamas leader. We love death. Our enemies love life. See the contrast? And you worry about moral equivalence with something like that? Okay? With blood and martyrs, with women and children. Because they're all expendable for the greater good, holy war. Or, here he is again, we love martyrdom, the way in which Hamas leaders died. And we don't get it, and so people march and put uh, things like glory to our martyrs on the George Washington University building, or they march with signs as they honor the martyrs of Palestine, realizing these people <laughs> are martyrs only because they're want to die and, and, and kill you in the process. I mean, that's, that's how they're honored. Here, 
annihilate Israel. Hamas leaders urge Gaza teens. And you know that there have been training, UNWAR, uh, United Nations Re- Works and Relief, uh, basically have been training camps for Palestinians in the Palestinian areas. They found many people who are actually in Hamas working for that organization. Uh, but there's a call for jihad to spread all over the world. Uh, Ron Dermer, and I know Ron personally, he was the former US, uh, Israeli ambassador to the U.S. He says Hamas is not a terrorist organization. They're a genocidal organization. And listen to why. Here are some of the uh, statements. You can see it on the screen. Uh, Allah turned the Jews into apes and pigs. You'll hear this all the time. I remember watching a program on Fox News way back when it had uh, Condoleezza Rice, a cartoon from the Muslim world, Condoleezza Rice, as though she were pregnant and inside her stomach was a, a monkey. And they were debating this on the TV. What's that mean? What is that talking about? No one seemed to get it. It was on Hannity. And I got on and, and texted him and said, I'll tell you what it's about. <laughs> okay. you know, tell me what they're trying to say. He says, it said, Condoleezza Rice gives birth to a new Middle East. And it is because of the U.S. support for Israel, sons of apes and pigs. Uh, so here's the statement from the Quran. The divine punishment of Jews is mentioned in three Quranic verses. They, they are those whom Allah has cast aside and on whom his wrath has fallen, and of whom he has made some as apes and swine. Another verse, you have surely known the end of those. Be ye like apes, despised. And because of that, and you can see all the statements here, uh, you know, oh, wretched pigs, barbaric monkeys, uh, all this kind of stuff. You're not human. You're subhuman. You, you may look human, but you're not. And that's why you can be slaughtered like an animal. Okay, the Quran says, I cast you into the unbelievers' hearts, terror. So smite above their necks and smite every finger of them. That's why they cut off the hands and cut off the heads, all of this kind of thing. Okay, desecrate them. When does that start? How is it that people keep asking, how could people go in with their, you know, their cell phones, video themselves, burning babies in ovens and beheading things and raping old women and doing all the horrible, horrible things we saw, filming it, putting it, you know, on uh, you know, the media, social media, calling their parents and say, I killed 10 Jews with my own hands, bragging about it. I mean, how can, how can someone be that way? We don't understand it. And the reason is that kind of barbaric mutilation can only be done by a human being who is indoctrinated from a young age when, when there's no sense, their natural sensitivity is not there. Here is something from the... Uh, Saudi Arabia television. Uh, this is back in 2002, but a Muslim woman's magazine TV program inter- interviewed a three and a half year old real Muslim girl about Jews. The girl was asked whether she liked the Jews. She answered no. When answered why she didn't like them, she said that Jews were apes and pigs. Who said this? The moderator asked. The girl answered, our God. Where did he say this? In the Quran. At the end of the interview, the pleased moderator said, no parents could wish for Allah to give them a more believing girl than she. May Allah bless her, her father and mother. The next generation of children must be true Muslims. We must educate them now while they are children so they will be true Muslims. Okay, you can get this kind of stuff live on memory, Middle East uh, media stuff, or Palestinian watch, all this stuff is there. So much of our Western world is woke and indoctrinated against facts and logic. Here's just some points. The Western worldview is more cultural than biblical. You know that. Even though we live in supposedly a Christian country, that was post-Christian a long time ago. We were long past that. Despite our Judeo-Christian foundation, when when modern culture is in opposition to biblical revelation, culture wins. That's what's happened with a lot of our Gen Z and even some millennials and others that are looking at the culture and they're saying the Bible seems so out of sync. It's just crazy what the Bible says. Instead of saying it's crazy what the culture does. No, but they, they, their priority is the culture. And so they're deconstructing all the time, you know, trying to, to fix this. 
The concept of a chosen people, Israel, is viewed as racism. You can't have a chosen people. And any war it carries out, even in response to those who seek its extermination, is viewed as genocide, even though one-sided. Biblical and historical rights to the land are viewed as colonization and occupation. This is true for professing Christians as well as secularists. I can't tell you how many Christians, younger than me, of course, but Christians, who fall right into this. Okay? Um, for instance, college students, we know on over 100 campuses, walk for Palestine. College students call for end to aid to Israel. There is, here's just some of the colleges. Our Ivy League schools, some of our best schools, by the way, supported largely by Jewish donors. You think about it? Okay, uh, these are some of the, the tops. And uh, Berkeley, Harvard, you know, uh, all of them. So what, what's going on here? Well, uh, the younger generation has been indoctrinated for decades with a worldview of, of the oppressed and the oppressors. Those who are deprived are not responsible, but there's some greater outside agent. No one ever says anymore, you know, if someone's hurting, well, buck up, you know, take, you know, take responsibility. What, what did you do? Oh, no, no, it's, I'm so sorry you're hurting. What did someone do to you? It's the world, it's the, it's the man, it's the, you know, something's doing this to you. The U.S., as Israel, is an oppressor and a colonizer. Any means of resistance and ultimate replacement by the oppressed is justifiable. Okay, nothing matters more than how you feel. Okay. Um, so here, here's some college students. Israel as a state is built on colonialization and apartheid state. Or, here's, we strike first because we wanted our land back. This is what they, they get. I mean, where else do you get it except for basically, uh, what, Instagram chats and TikTok? I mean, where, where are you going to get your, your news? <laughs> All right. So we saw a week or so ago Aaron Bushnell uh, set himself on fire, uh, screaming, free Palestine. He's a Gen Zer radicalized, uh, talked about uh, protesting Israel and America's colonizers. Uh, you know, his final words were free Palestine. Uh, and you look at surveys, you can see what's going on. Uh, people 65 and up, which is a lot of us in this room, 81% think Israel's military response to Hamas is justified. Yeah, they ought to do that. They, they were attacked. But see what happens as you drop down in age. From 50 from to 64, 56%. And when you get down to the 18 to 34-year-olds, it's only 27%. Why the radical difference? Why? What's going on here? Why such a difference? All right. Old guys watching Fox News and everybody else. No, that's not just it. <laughs> the younger generation evaluates truth from a relative rather than absolute and a subjective rather than objective perspective. As a result, social justice, or rather justice, or really injustice against someone, is determined by how others perceive or feel about their situation. Therefore, they do not search for facts, but declare solidarity based on feelings. So we're here young enough to say, that's right, okay? All right. Uh, here's a couple more. Gen Z, remember I, I, I taught the last 16 years this age group, so Gen Z does not get news from any cable or streaming news source. It gets it from Instagram comments, TikTok, like I said. These news sources are controlled either by personal opinion or outright propaganda from the CCP, like TikTok. Or cyber terrorist. It's styled for youth and mainly anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian, promoting terrorist organizations as resistance movements. The Western democratic, multicultural, pluralistic worldview is completely unknown and opposed in most of the Middle East. The majority of people in the Middle East are Muslim. They don't value individuality. They must conform to the Islamic world that denounces democracy and free expression. Westerners value life, whereas Muslims value death and martyrdom, which is the means to paradise. Impressionable youth can be groomed into terrorist sympathies by CRT and all the other stuff that it's here. So let me ask you, which, which statement is true about Gaza? 
Here's one. We have, all have the same priorities. We can negotiate with anyone and everyone. Everyone is reasonable. Everyone wants the same thing, even if circumstances get a little out of hand from time to time. Even if a couple of weeks a year rockets fly from Gaza into Tel Aviv, that's just the frustration of reasonable people with reasonable priorities. It's just a cycle of violence. Hamas is occupied with governing 2.5 million Palestinians in Gaza and has abandoned the idea of violent resistance. We must show restraint and offer negotiation to resolve this conflict. How many vote for that one? Just one. <laughs> All right. Or how about this one? Hamas never cared about the 2.5 million Palestinians in Gaza. Every bit of money that ever flowed into Gaza over the course of the last 20 years has been used for the purchase of murdering Jews. They don't care about their own people. Their highest aspiration is death. They hide military installations under schools and hospitals and tell people to stay in place so they can die and Israel can be blamed for their atrocities. Some of you, how many people have been to Israel here? Okay. Quite a lot, okay? Um, you remember this spot? You ever, you ever seen those beautiful spots? Anybody know where that is in Israel? See, it's a be beautiful place there. Look, malls and Ferris wheels and everything you can imagine. So where is this? This is Gaza. This is Gaza when Israel had it under siege from 1967 to 2005. What was the picture it was painted? There were also Jews living there in settlements at the time. They were trying to improve things. Now, this is the Gaza you know after it was liberated in 2007 by Hamas. Okay, reduced to poverty. I mean, some of the, the pretty stuff was still there, but uh, not the same. All right, and we know that 500 miles of terrorist tunnels were dug. That, that costs a lot of money to those terrorist tunnels. Training constantly going on, armaments, missiles, everything you can imagine stored under schools, 36 hospitals There's in Gaza. There's not that many in almost any country in the Middle East, okay? And all these, a lot of the staff of the hospital were Hamas. Under the hospitals were storages of armaments and then the terror tunnels under the hospitals. All this, of course, to draw Israeli fire at some point in time. Yet what we see is, you know, the United States is part of those, that oppressive system $30 billion in military aid to Israel to bomb and kill and maim and keep these people in subjectivity. But then Biden gave billions to Iran before October 7, and he pledged $100 million to Gaza after for so-called aid, but it, of course went to Hamas because they're in control of everything. This is kind of an amazing thing. All these funds with zero oversight. Um, these are all proxies of Iran. Uh, so everything kind of gets all thrown in together. Um, here, Iran, uh, they gave all the weapons to Hamas to strike Israel. They trained their soldiers. You think what happened on October 7th just was, uh, you know, hey, let's next week go kill some Jews. No, this was a year in training and preparation and organization. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. It involved cyber terrorism. It involved all kind of things were not quite yet understanding, but uh, will someday. 150,000 high-tech missiles given to Hamas. And of course, Iran's also funding Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, and all the rest. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we don't like hearing this stuff. It, uh, it didn't sound good. Anti-Semitism, we've talked about that in this conference. The Western world doesn't understand it either or we wouldn't have so much of it. For instance, you have a 388% rise in anti-Semitism in the U.S. since 10-7, right after October. Uh, you can see people marching with all their signs. You see ethnic, they get complaining about ethnic cleansing, you have signs like this, you know, uh, to cl cleanse the world of Jews. Here, here's in Toronto, here's in Istanbul, Jews not allowed, Jews not welcome, Zionist. Uh, and so what was the response of our country to this, this huge rise in anti-Semitism that you saw on the TVs, you saw on the college campuses? Here's the answer. The White House announced its anti-Islamophobia strategy amidst the large spike in anti-Semitism. Because obviously, we, 
everybody's equal here. You know, if there's anti-Semitism, there must be Islamophobia too, and Asian hate and everything else. Here's Kamala. As a result of the Hamas terrorist attack in Israel, the Biden administration announces the first national strategy to counter Islamophobia. What? Okay. All right. So, this also involves moral equivalency. We always hear, you know, uh, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Right? No. But Hamas's actions are said to be reinforcing a shared pathology. People treated like animals act like animals, right? They can't help it. They're just resisting oppression. You're being treated this way and deprived. This is the way people respond. So therefore, this is a rage of resistance is the consequence of Israel's 75 years of ethnic cleansing. However, proportionality, motive, and method, as well as history, must be the measure. Muslims think in terms of religious duty to murder and massacre as prescribed by the Quran. Hamas and its sponsors use any means to annihilate Israel and all Kufa, the unbelievers, non-Muslims, whether soldier or civilian. By the way, they don't believe there are any civilians in Israel. You know why? Because everybody eventually, getting out of high school, goes into the IDF, boys and girls alike. So they're either going to be military, they either are military or they're going to be military. So they can't be civilians. They're all, you know, in that camp. Uh, whether young or old. Any wounded are tortured, violated, dismembered. Israel follows a, a very measured response, avoiding as much as possible harming civilians. I mean, if, look, if Israel were to take care of things and avoid any, you know, deaths on their side, they'd just go carpet bomb everything. They wouldn't, you know, and they'd say, look, in war you have this. You have a two to one ratio or something like that. There's always been civilian casualties, can't help it. No, they do these investigative things. They warn people they're coming. They call them on the phones. They, they, they target very surgically. They bypass a lot of opportunities because it would compromise it. The only people that do that, they, when the wounded are, are recovered, they treat them just like they would their own wounded. Okay, this is the way it goes. So, uh, Israel follows a measured response, avoiding as much as possible harming civilians. They provide medical service to the wounded enemy as they do their own soldiers. Hamas used its 36 hospitals for terrorism and weapons storage, used its civilians as human shields, placed their military installations beneath homes, mosques, and schools in order to multiply civilian casualties and provoke international sympathy and opposition to Israel. Israel uses bombs to shield its people. Hamas uses people to shield its bombs. No possible moral equivalency here, all right? And look, here's an example just up on the streets. You've seen the side. Zionism is genocide. Okay, well, if the Jews are, cons are considered, you know, guilty of genocide, what about the Palestinians? Because if you say Palestine will be free from the river to the sea, that's exactly what you mean. You're calling for genocide. <laughs> and yet, that just bypasses people. How about the Hamas massacre on October 7th? I mean, this is a documentation of crimes against humanity. This is why, and, and the documentation comes from Hamas, not just from the Israelis. But here is a good-hearted preacher. When churches justify a genocide or a silent watching from a distance, making carefully crafted balance statements, the credibility of the gospel is at stake. It's all about humanity. Pray for Gaza. That's what was there. Uh, no. Where's this guy getting his, his ideas? Here's Nasrallah of Hezbollah. He claimed his speech on November 3rd that the October 7th massacre included all of the reported atrocities that was actually carried out by the Israel Defense Forces on their own Israeli civilians. And they just say it. Just say it all the time. Uh, what can you do about that? So what is the real cause of the Middle East conflict. I've hinted at it, uh, and what we call it is the elephant in the room. And most places we don't like to talk about religion. Uh, that's for the uneducated and the people who want to cause trouble. We avoid the subject of religion. And um, 
And yet we heard Hamas say, look, this is, uh, it, it, the Palestinian problem is a religious problem. It's got to be dealt with on that basis. Here we have the Supreme Islamic Research Council stating a long time ago, the Palestine question is not a national issue, nor is it a political issue. It's first and foremost an Islamic question. They say it. Okay, it's not us saying it. Hamas, um, which is the Islamic resistance movement, nevertheless, they say our struggle against the Jews is very great and very serious. It's a step that inevitably should be followed by other steps. The movement is but one squadron that should be supported by more and more squadrons from this vast Arab and Islamic world until the enemy is vanquished and Allah's victory is realized. Article 8 of their charter, Allah is its target, the prophet is its model, the Quran is its constitution, jihad is its path, and death for the sake of Allah is the loftiest of its wishes. And it says Israel will exist and continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it just as it obliterated others before it. So Hamas does not want a two-state solution. It wants a final solution. Okay. This is, my friends, holy war. This is jihad. Uh, here is University of Al-Azhar. It's in Cairo. Scholar Dr. Uh, Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al-Buti. Uh, he's a jurist. He said, the holy war, as it is known in Islamic jurisprudence, is basically an offensive war. Not defensive. No, we're, we take it to you. This is the duty of Muslims in every age when the needed military power becomes available to them. This is the phase in which the meaning of holy war has taken its final form. Thus the apostle of Allah said, I was commanded to fight the people until they believe in Allah and its message. And we see this on the streets, okay? Long live the intifada. That's a call for jihad. And we see on the news, globalize the intifada on the United Kingdom streets. And we hear now from the Shia side, not the Sunni side, uh, from Iraq. This was back when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was in control. He said Israel must be wiped off the map, world without Zionism. And he said the only problem is we got this Western defense uh, for Israel, and we got to get rid of that. So if the U.S. has to be destroyed first, uh, remove the Western defense, and then we can eliminate the state of Israel. So that's why it's always death to America, death to Israel. Okay, when we talk about the Palestinians, uh, we're talking about Wahhabi Islam. If you don't know what Wahhabi is, uh, this was also Osama bin Laden. I mean, this is Saudi Arabia. This is all of <clears throat> the, about 90% of the Muslims worldwide. This is their type of Islam. Here's what it is. It's a radical sect of Islam founded by the 18th century Arabian nationalist reformer Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Wahhab sought to reverse the century-old decline of the Muslim empire by removing the cultural pollution of Western influence and returning Islam to the past golden age where the Quran was interpreted literally and Islamic law was fundamentally practiced and strictly enforced. What does it mean by removing the cultural pollution? This is that golden age of Islam where we have scientific achievements, mathematical things, exploration, culture, and art. <laughs> you gotta get, go back to the good old days of jihad. And so uh, you can't have any of this non-literal interpretation like the Sufis and others of the Quran. Get right back to the letter of the law. And we believe in literal interpretation too. All right? So, so the... the you know, world views depend on word views. Okay, so if you, I, I have no problem saying I'm a fundamentalist in that sense because if fundamentalism believes I take the text literally and authoritative, you believe it, good. But mine is good and godly and holy and just and right, and theirs is not. <laughs> okay, and that's the difference. Now, in, uh, uh, as a literal interpretation of the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah, Wahhabi theology promotes offensive jihad and promises heavenly reward in paradise with celestial matings for jihadic martyrs. You'd be amazed to hear what that really means. Okay, it's incredible stuff. In 1744, Muhammad ibn Saad, the local ruler of Daria, a town north of Riyadh, embraced Wahhab's teachings and the two swore an oath of allegiance to spread this purified faith throughout Arabia. In pure form, Wahhabism is a death cult. 
which has spearheaded the violent revolutionary overthrow of Islamic countries such as Afghanistan, whose local government was replaced with the radical Taliban rule under Sharia, that is, fundamentalist law. Uh, so, when you talk about Saudi Arabia, Mecca, Medina, the caretakers of Islam around the world, this is what they're protecting. And that is also what the Palestinian Authority holds. So here in Ramallah in the West Bank, we have Mahmoud Abbas, president of the Palestine National Authority. Mike t gave us a little insight about him, but here's some facts about this guy. He was co-founded with Yasser Arafat. He claimed responsibility for many of the suicide bombs and terrorist attacks. Uh, he's the one that supported and wrote the paychecks for the Palestinian terrorist who murdered 11 Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics. Nice guy. He earned his doctorate for the University of Moscow for a dissertation. Mike gave us the title, but it basically argued the Holocaust was an invention of the Jews to gain international sympathy for the creation of the Jewish state. And he has campaigned along Islamic Jihad and Hamas terrorists, calling them heroes and Israel the Zionist enemy. So you th what about this guy? Here's another fact. The Palestine National Authority never abolished the notorious PLO covenant calling for the liquidation of the state of Israel. The fact that this document, including this message that the Jewish state of Israel is destined to perish, is still valid. It signifies both the unwillingness and the ability of the PNA leadership to change its attitude towards Israel. Arafat said, if we get a Palestinian state, we will change this and recognize Israel. All right? But it never happened. So, and they never did it. All right? So a peace treaty between two rival parties must include a specific article in which the parties declare an end to all mutual claims. PLO, PNA, cannot and will not sign such a document. For them, the goal is still the establishment of Palestinian state stretching from the river to the sea, sole purpose of eliminating the Jewish state. And what has happened? When, when in 2005 they had the national election, Hamas won, and Hamas started killing Fatah, our PNA uh, leaders, they fled to Ramallah and, and took up residence in the West Bank. Now, after all of that, they've come back together, and they've ended their, their split on Gaza. So you see Ismail Haniya, and you see uh, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, you see in secret, they have these post-war alliances. They've met in Moscow to discuss unified Palestinian government together, running this thing. Um, the West Bank, which they run, is, is surges as Israel steps up rages, arrest and things. West Bank's a possible third front for Israel. Uh, most focus is on Gaza, but Israel is dealing with the violence and tension in the West Bank. We have car rammings, we have stabbings, we have, you know, just drive-by shootings, we have all kind of things happening. Ramadan is coming up this next week, and they're calling for, you know, days of rage and terror and all of this. We'll see what happens. But, uh, but support for Hamas persists throughout the West Bank. Okay? Uh, this is what we see happening. The Palestinian Authority TV from Gaza praises Hamas terror massacre on Israel, calls for all hostages, calls all the hostages settlers. If you're a settler, it couldn't be worse thing on the face of the earth. And so we have Blink and go over, shake hands and say, you know, uh, all is well. Because the U.S. only views Hamas and the Palestinian Authority from a political perspective. They cannot accept that religion of Islam unifies them in purpose and method. And that's a blindness. And that's what causes the problems we have. Um, here's a meeting with uh, the Russians. Kremlin says, Palestinian Authority Abbas has a standing invitation to Moscow. Um, Washington welcomes steps for Palestinian Authority to reform and revitalize itself. President Abbas has said he's going to take steps toward reforming and revitalizing the Palestinian Authority. And our government says, well, welcome in taking those steps. Well, here's a step. It's going to take a lot of reforming and revising. Abbas advisor in Islam, Jews are humanoids, creatures that Allah created in the form of humans, apes and pigs. Okay. Kind of hard to revise and reform when that's your attitude. So, as Ibn Warak uh, wrote in his book, Why I'm Not a Muslim, 
He said there may be moderate Muslims, but Islam itself is not moderate. Okay, the guy that drives you around in a taxi or waits in the convenience store or who you may know personally, you know, I, you know more about Islam than I do, they'll say. You know, I, I just don't know. I just follow the, you know, what I'm supposed to do. Uh, does it, they don't know. They're moderate to that extent unless called to be part of the Ummah, the, the whole larger Arab world, and they, they conform. There's no difference between Islam and Islamic fundamentalism. At most, there's a difference of degree, but not of kind. Islamic fundamentalism is a totalitarian construct derived by Muslim jurists from the fundamental and defining text of Islam. Islamic fundamentalism has global aspirations, the submission of the entire world to the all-embracing Sharia, Islamic law, a fascist system of dictates designed to control every single act of all individuals. And um, <clears throat> just to remind you, on September 11th, I, I videoed this. I was videotaping things that day. It was only up that day, okay? But in New Jersey, you had the Palestinian community waving flags and handing out candy. The same thing was in Ramallah. So this is all these various Palestinian communities in the United States as well as the Middle East all celebrating the attack on our country. Kids, others, you know, is that moderate to you? Well, we've talked about the cause for war in general with the Middle East, but why this war? What are they saying is the cause of this war? And this is very important to understand. Here, this came out the same day as the attack. Uh, here's Hania saying, we have achieved victory in the battle for Jerusalem, the defense of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the axis of this conflict. Whoa, what? No, nobody attacked Jerusalem. What's this? I thought it was all about Gaza, their land. It, no. He hails this victory in battle for Jerusalem. And then we have these kind of statements. The Hamas commander says it's attacks are in defense of Al-Aqsa, which is what they call the Temple Mount. Claims 5,000 missiles fired against Israel. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is the focal point of Israeli-Palestinian tensions. Hamas says... This is the start of Operation Al-Aqsa Deluge, or Al-Aqsa Flood. He claimed that the operation was launched in retaliation for Israel's desecration of the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. He asked the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem to join forces to expel the occupiers and demolish the walls. So in Islam, holy sites determine holy war agenda. <clears throat> Frankly, I mean, from an Islamic way of thinking, any land ever acquired by Islam in the past has to remain under the control of Islam in perpetuity. Okay, they may lose it for a time, but they have to get it back. Honor of Allah requires it. Okay, and uh, this is an interesting situation. Uh, what has happened, though, uh, since 9-11, uh, since um, COVID, uh, I was going over some right after that, and I took these pictures, <clears throat> you have Orthodox Jews going up to the Temple Mount to pray. Wait a minute, that's a violation of the status quo agreement. You can't do that. Well, so was building a mosque, you know, for 10,000 people on the Temple Mount and many other things they did. The status quo has, has been junked a long time ago. I mean, I mean, the, the walk control of the Temple Mount forbade Jews and tourists and everybody else from coming up there for three years. It, it took some of the, the, you know, cabinet members to go in and force the issue. But Israel is quite letting Jews pray on the Temple Mount. And here you see uh, Itamar ben Gavir. He's the Knesset member and member minister of national security. And he's up there praying with them. So that to the Palestinians was a great affront these guys are all praying here. Now, we used to say that secular Jews didn't really care about the temple, and they don't from a religious perspective, but they are backing the issue of prayer mostly to prove sovereignty. Because in 1980, Israel annexed East Jerusalem. It's no longer East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. Jerusalem is no longer East Berlin and West Berlin, although prove that on the maps, okay? but it's, it was there. 
And they did that to extend sovereignty over the whole of the city. It's the entire uh, place is the capital of Israel. As I said, East Jerusalem has Hadassah Hospital, Hebrew University, the, the Supreme Court, the Knesset, <laughs> on and on, okay? So this is very Jewish and very Israeli, but they could not extend that sovereignty to the Temple Mount because of, shall we say, international concerns, other concerns. They, they let the Muslims from 1967 just have it. Moshe Dayan said, look, the rabbis say we can't even go up there and pray. Why should we go up there? It's going to cause an international incident. You know, let's just let them have it. We have the Western Wall, the Kotel. They have, we're below, they're above. What's the problem? Well, the problem is they don't recognize that. Muslims say, what's the Kotel? Oh, that, uh, that is um, Al-Burak Wall. That's Muhammad's celestial steed, Al-Burak, who had the head of a woman and the body of a, of a horse and the tail of a peacock and the, and the wings of an eagle and flew him uh, by night to uh, Al-Aqsa, to ascend to heaven where Jesus bowed down to him with all the other prophets. Yeah, that's, so it's al Burak wall. It's not your coattail. Anyway, these kind of things make Israelis say, something's not right here. I mean, this is the holiest place on earth for us, and it's maybe third or fourth in Islam after Mecca, Medina, and something in Saudi Arabia or Iran or wherever. So we had before October 7th, 50,000 Jews ascended and prayed on the Temple Mount. That's a big deal, including military figures and others, okay? And there's Rabbi Yehuda Glick. If you don't know uh, Rabbi Glick, um, he was in the Knesset. He got shot six times and recovered from it uh, for these kind of things, but uh, there he is. So Hamas threatened violence to Jewish uh, visitors to the Temple Mount during the High Holidays. Here's the statement by Mahmoud al-Zahar, Hamas co-founder. He said, Jewish prayers are a blatant attack on the religious and Islamic status of the city and the mosque, even though this is the site of the Jewish temple, even though it's under Israeli sovereignty, even though there was a status quo agreement that they signed that said freedom of religion. But he says, the, this has, the, Israel bears the full responsibility for dragging the entire region into an open religious war. Hear those words? So in April of 2023, the Al-Aqsa Mosque became the center of conflict again um, because you had just problems attacking those who were praying. Uh, the police had to step in and dis disperse the crowd with tear gas and things like that. And you see the protesters understand some of that. Here, hands off of Jerusalem. You see that kind of thing. And here's one that's very disturbing. Uh, you remember the picture of the paraglider that, that went into the music festival and slaughtered all the youth. Um, okay, now we see the image of the paraglider coming into Jerusalem. And this, by the way, was text to a staff by an employee at the Homeland Security and received numerous thumbs-up replies. That was reported to Secretary Alejandro McOrkis, who refused to dismiss this woman for promoting terrorism, put her only on administrative leave. That's a little disturbing, is it not, to see that kind of imagery? The Alexa flood is just the first time. There will be a second and a third and a fourth, okay, according to Hamas. Now, it's more than that. The Palestinian Grand Mufti incites masses to inflame Temple Mount tensions. Uh, this was already in August before this happened. And here's what the, the sheik said. The occupation authorities are attempting to execute the extremist settlers' plan to put their hands on the Blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque as part of a series of extremist acts and that the occupied authorities and extremists are carrying out to harm Jerusalem, the blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque. And this is in order to tighten their control over them and build the alleged temple, heaven forbid. He warned against the consequences of this aggression and against the outbreak of a fierce religious war. Okay, so if you want to build the temple, and we have actually a scripture in Exodus 25, 8 that says, let them build for me a sanctuary that they may dwell in their midst. They take that as an ongoing command, whatever it's possible, to perform. Uh, it is, after all, their Temple Mount. 
They had it longer than anybody. But this is part of the incitement. Uh, when we, we look at the temple movement, Temple Institute, others, the temple vessels are ready for the rebuild of Jerusalem's third temple. And most of you have seen those kind of vessels. They're all done. It started in 1987, was finished probably a year or so ago. And this is what Islamic leaders fear and fight, that uh, someone would dare to erect the temple again. Now, we can't say. We know the temple will stand one day as part of prophecy. How that will happen, we'll speculate on that tomorrow night. Okay, I got some issues that come out of the consequences of this war, my own speculation. But this is what they fear, and this is what they say is the cause of the war. But there's one more thing they add, the go to red heifers. Okay, whatever you think of red heifers, what they think is it is a provocation. And Hamas reveals the hidden reason for the October 7th attacks, the red heifer. Okay, so why? You know, better dead than red, they would say. <laughs> All right, a little twist on words. All right, uh, here's a news article. Scared of a baby cow? Palestinians say Israel is planning to build a third temple, destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And, you know, frankly, there is no way they can coexist. People say, well, I could just build it next door, couldn't you? I say, well, no, wait a minute. That's a pagan structure with pagan people worship it there. That would defile and desecrate. You couldn't, how could you keep ritual purity and everything else going? Uh, you, would, you couldn't do that. You know, no, no Orthodox Jew who wants to build a temple would allow that. Likewise, no fundamentalist Muslim would allow it either, you know, side by side. They won't allow it now, I expect they'll allow it later. So the only way you can do this is the, the kind of replacement theology I believe in, okay? <laughs> Okay, so I believe one day this will replace the church. Okay, that's okay. all right. So, um, so Channel 12 reported here that millions of shekels are transferred to organizations that promote the issue, that is, of the red heifer. Right now, the red heifer is a city in Shiloh. Okay, the kibbutz Shiloh, and they're basically uh, there was five of them. I think three left still to validate. And uh, it's been explained, you have to have one of these qualified red heifers have a calf that then would qualify also, because it can't have a yoke put on it, can't have a blemish. It's very hard to get an animal in place or another without that happening. And then it has to grow that way till three years of age before it can be actually offered. So this is what they're up against, but this is the, shall we say, uh, the greatest opportunity they've had and all the years they've been trying to pull this project off. So the Red Heifer Project's under the auspices of the Temple Institute, um, and on and on. So uh, here's the articles you'll see. The stage is set for the end time war against Israel because of this, the temple and the other stuff. Uh, Jewish group says end times Bible prophecy fulfilled. Flawless Red Heifer could signal the third temple. This organization, Bonei Yisrael, the builder of Israel in connection with the Temple Institute, worked to locate a perfect red heifer in Texas, brought them to Israel in September, be raised with the goal of a heifer. Okay, this was the past, but you can see the goals, how, how excited this is for them. They've even gone through the process of burning a, a heifer uh, to see what it would be like. To, and you have, you have priests today actualizing these things, doing sacrifices at all the major feasts, not on the Temple Mount, but near the Temple Mount, trying to say, you know, it's a temple in preparation. Here is an update from January. Um, basically, uh, this is a military spokesman for Hamas, and he says in a televised speech marking 100 days since the October 7th attack, our path in Al-Aqsa reached its peak with the bringing of red cows. To much of the world, such a statement seems strange, but to a Messianic believer, the charge is loaded with Messianic implications. The bringing of red cows referred to the 2022 20, arrival of the five red heifers, and on and on, uh, points to redemption. Why is that? Because according to Maimonides, he says there were 10 red heifers given to the world, Nine existed from the time of Moshe until the second temple. 
And the tenth red heifer will be accomplished by King Messiah. So their belief is that when the tenth red heifer, that is the next red heifer, appears, it is associated with the Messianic era. So does that perhaps mean the appearance of a red heifer in these waning end times is an indication, a forerunner of the appearance of the Messiah himself who officiate at its preparation? As they say, this is from the Temple Institute website, uh, if there has been no red heifer for the past 2,000 years, perhaps it is because the time was not right. Israel was far from being ready. But now, now, what could it mean for the times we live in to have the means of purification so close at hand? If there are now red heifers, is ours the era that will need them? So this is the kind of thing that's being said. The red heifers are thriving, okay? Um, we still, we're still not there yet, but as of January, uh, they're going to take the... Is, is the heifers by the horns. Uh, you know, if it, if it sprouts a white hair, it's disqualified. You think, you know, our theological splitting of hairs is a problem. <laughs> All right. But here, uh, you've got the para aduma and the red heifers, and they're working with it. Uh, one step closer to building the third temple. Um, you know, a genuine red heifer is the idea fulfilling 2,000 years of Bible prophecy in the end of days. And, you know, so this is holy cow. How can one heifer herald the third temple and the end of the world as we know it? This is the news reports you get, you get spread out there. Um, signal of the third temple and end times. Israelis come to see the red heifer discuss the temple. And on and on it goes. Now, show you how serious this is. Um, in, in the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, more officers are now religious. There's a big uptick in religious devotion. The percentage of officer cadets who are religious has grown tenfold since the 1990s. The IDF struggles with rise in influence of religious Zionists. They increasingly represent a larger percentage of the IDF, um, and, and the, which combine these Jewish values with military values. Uh, here's a guy, they, they're wearing this patch. They wear it on the helmet, they wear it on the uniform. It's a patch that says rebuild the temple. Okay, uh, so here is an example. Uh, you have the, the Temple Institute is giving shofars to be blown, but they're blowing shofars before going into battle. They meet, uh, there are prayers given, there's reading of Torah. A lot of this stuff, it, it indicates something very different than what we've seen before. Uh, that they actually think of this in terms of religious war. War for the Temple Mount. Here's an example of the patches that are worn. Many of the IDF soldiers in Gaza and the north are sp sporting patches on the uniforms depicting the Holy Temple, expressing a clear statement of what this war is really about. Hamas made it clear from the start when they named their barbaric attack on Israeli citizens, men and women and children, the Al-Aqsa flood. Al-Aqsa being the jihadist nomenclature for the Temple Mount. Yes, Iranian-backed Hamas, as well as Iran's other terror proxies, are waging war against Israel, against Jerusalem, against the Holy Temple, against the Holy, all the Holy Temple stands for. Peace, brotherhood, prayer, love for Hashem's world. Israel's fight is a fight for the future of the entire world, and the Holy Temple represents potential for all good in the world. The IDF soldiers who are wearing the Temple patch know exactly what they are fighting for and why. A house of prayer for all nations. Here's some more examples. You see tents with the, the temple on there, okay? Um, and you see helmets and you, you, all this kind of stuff. And I said the silver trumpets are being blown uh, as they go into battle from Numbers 10, fulfilling the law. If you go into war in your land against an adversary that opposes, you shall blow a Torah with the trumpets and be remembered before the Lord your God. And thus be saved from your enemies perpetual statute for all your generations. It takes people who believe to do those kind of things. So as one woman on a film recently said it, the war we are waging is a war for the Temple Mount. Now, what I've tried to show you is that first, this is a religious war. People don't get it. They don't understand that. It's anything but that for our government. In terms of the people marching in the streets, they're, they use religious slogans. They shout religious statements. They don't know what they're saying. Okay? And that's because of the way they've been groomed and indoctrinated. Um, in Israel, they're very conscious of what they're doing. And you know, while the religious element is still a marginal thing, 
And whatever we believe about the rebuilding of the temple or the red heifers, you know, not the point. The point is that that is a catalyst for this kind of war. And out of it, I'm going to explain tomorrow night, if things go in a certain direction, it's going to be an incentive for some kind of judgment on the Temple Mount going forward. It may change a lot of things, set the stage for the end time. So I want you to be sure to come for that. In the meantime, we know God will defend his people. He says he would. The Lord, your God, is he who fights for you just as he promised you in Joshua. And God will preserve his people. He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. So that's very religious too, is it not? But that comes from God's own mouth. And uh, I, I hope explaining all this hasn't been too troublesome or confusing. We can settle that with some of the question and answers. But let me just say as we conclude the book, What Should We Think About Israel? Written by a number of us uh, who have been speakers here this week and some who are not, like Tim Sigler over here who is, uh, is visiting, but uh, hopefully he'll speak to you in years to come uh, with RAL Ministries. Others uh, involved both from the Middle East and from Europe and the United States wrote in this book to explain to you what we should think about it. We wrote it for the younger demographic because I had Jews for Jesus, chosen people uh, primarily come to me and say, we, we have a problem. You know, parents supported Israel, the kids aren't. What do we do about that? We got to get the word out to them. So this was written mainly for the younger generation with some journaling and other stuff inside. Uh, whether they read it or not, I don't know. There's also um, there is a what do you call it um, when you record the thing? <laughs> Sorry, audio book. It's an audio thing of this as well. Okay, guys. Yeah, get it up there. All right also have, since we talked about Jerusalem, the focus of the Temple Mount is one of the real problems. If you don't understand those things, have a book called Jerusalem and Prophecy and one on the Temple and Bible Prophecy. Uh, those are both here at our table. As I mentioned, we had other books that I've written in the past on Holy War, dealing with Jihad, Fast Facts of the Middle East Conflict, and then a one called The Battle for the Last East Temple or The Battle for the Temple Mount, which deals with the history of battles on the Temple Mount, including the future battles to come. And then a uh, book we have on back there, Evangelical Study Bible. Uh, it, it, it was designed by our Liberty School of Divinity to have the kind of uh, things you don't usually get from a combined faculty. Uh, special creation, young earth, literal Adam and Eve, global flood all explained, defended. Uh, it's dispensational, pre-trib, pre-mill, messianic focus. There's over 100 full-color archaeological notes. Uh, I did I did the notes for Joshua, First, Second Samuel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Ezekiel, so you get some of that stuff too. But we have that back there, and it's just came out this last year, so it's I, I think a good uh, study Bible for you. And then our ministry, WorldOfTheBible.com, has a lot of free materials, uh, stuff I've written in the past is all there for you to download. Uh, a lot of other things that will help, and uh, we also, of course, do tours. Uh, we're doing a tour in, in a few weeks. Uh, Footsteps of the Apostles to uh, Greece and Turkey. We'll be doing one in January to Egypt, all over, uh, going again to Israel uh, next year, about this time. We had to cancel our June trip for obvious reasons, but uh, we'll be doing it again. So invite you to come on any of those, and Robbie Dean has them too. So uh, whoever you go, just go. Go with someone who can really explain this to you. You can see it firsthand. All right. <laughs> Any, any, any questions? Okay, right here, Robbie. You, wanna... Where do you, think... you have time, right? It's... Yeah. Okay. Wait, you got to. It's because of the people online, they can't hear if you don't have the microphone. So. That's right. So, speaking without a microphone is an unforgivable sin. <laughs> That would be blasphemy. So my question uh, has to do with what do you think Netanyahu is thinking about with respect to all of this? Uh, that's a hard one. Um, he's just trying to survive right now, and it's, it's probably unlikely that he will. 
But, uh, I mean, for, for sure, he doesn't want a two-state solution. He's going to do whatever he can, I think, to probably prevent that because it's suicide for Israel, at least coming out of this. Because you can eliminate Hamas in Gaza, but what about the rest of the country? You know, and same mentality, same ideology, same zeal. Uh, something's going to have to be done. I don't know. Um, he's trying to, of course, placate the U.S. and other powers. Uh, you don't want to rile them up. And he doesn't like bet Biden or trust Biden. Who who would? I mean, uh, in, I mean, in terms of foreign relations and things, you just uh, you get you. It goes both ways. Uh, I, again, he keeps saying, right now we're fighting a war, let's fight the war, let's get through with the war, then we'll deal with these other issues. But I think he's quite concerned. I mean, he's actually, in a soft way, supported the temple uh, rebuilding and things like this with different people. Uh, but there's a lot of things he's done. You know, he, he goes to a Bible study, uh, his son, one of his sons, won the award for Bible memory in Israel. Uh, he's secular, but that doesn't mean he doesn't know the Bible. He certainly knows history. You know, his father was a major historian, wrote a huge book on the Inquisition. He, and Netanyahu wrote A Place Among the Nations, among some other books. He knows very clearly the religious Muslim agenda, as well as anybody does. But what do you do about it? So... It's a problem playing politics. Yeah. Uh, Randy, you talked a little bit about uh, all the preparations for coming temple. Would you comment on the distinction? There's going to be clearly a tribulation temple, but I see that as different from the millennial temple. Can sure. you make it? Can you comment the distinction? And yeah, for sure. I mean the. Uh, we call it the tribulation temple because it exists during the tribulation. When Paul speaks of it, he calls it the temple of God. So a temple built for the, according to religious law or biblical dimension, following what they think is God's command, uh, would still be a temple for God. Uh, but it, and that's the reason the Antichrist can desecrate it. Okay? It... it he sits himself in the temple of God, exalts himself of every, every so-called object of worship and God himself, making himself out to be God. That's what desecrates. That's the abomination. Of that's, that's what does that to the temple, rendering the sacrificial system null and void. I mean, and that's what Daniel 9 tells us. So he stops the sacrifice and offering. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's happening. So this is simply a temple, uh, just like after the exile, there was Zerubbabel's temple, and then there was Herodian temple, and this would be the next temple in line. Uh, from my understanding, it, it probably will, the next temple probably will be the tribulation temple. Uh, when you read in Zechariah 14.3 how the Messiah's feet touch the Mount of Oz and it splits, you notice it divides uh, north-south and creates a east-west valley, probably right through the Temple Mount. So my opinion that that temple would be destroyed, and the Jews would flee through the valley to escape. Um, and then, of course, when the Millennial Temple is built, you have a topographical change. It says, you know, Jerusalem will remain on its place, but it will rise. And so it's a very different topography. Different yeah, I mean, the whole platform is 30 times larger than the previous. The temple's the same size, basically, but the complex is larger. And so that, those are very different places. All right, thank, Randy, thank you very much. That was good. Look forward to tomorrow night. As we prepare to close, uh, David Whitelock's going to come up and lead us in our closing hymn, number 591, The Sands of Time Are Sinking. And I've got one announcement that if you went to Israel last June with me, Come up here at the end, and we're going to get a group picture of those who were went to Israel last summer. And uh, so the rest, everybody else who's not here wants to see our picture. So you all come up here as soon as we're done. David.
this side on? Okay. 591, first, all four verses. Everybody's standing up. All right, it starts off the sands of time. Are you got it, Rosie? Okay, here we go. The sands of time are seeking the dawn of heaven. time today to think about what is going on. We sense that things appear to be growing toward a toward an end, but it may not be that soon. We need to be steadfast. We need to be strong. We need to be focused on the word and keep our focus on fulfilling our mission. So Father, we thank you for what we've learned today and this evening. We pray we get a good night's sleep. We pray for some who aren't uh, feeling so good today, we pray that you would restore them with the night's sleep and um, just give them strength for tomorrow. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.